Elegy by Charles Leroy Nutt, writing as Charles Beaumont. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. It was an impossible situation, an asteroid in space where no asteroid should have been, with a city that could only have existed back on Earth. Elegy by Charles Beaumont Would you mind repeating that? I said, sir, that Mr. Friden says, sir, that he sees a city. A city? Yes, sir. Mr. Weber rubbed the back of his hand along his cheek. You realize, of course, that that is impossible. Yes, sir. Send Mr. Friden in to see me at once. The young man saluted and rushed out of the room. He returned with a somewhat older man who wore spectacles and frowned. Now then, said Captain Weber, what's all this Lieutenant Peterson tells me about a city? Are you enjoying a private little joke, Friden? Friden shook his head emphatically. No, sir. Then perhaps you'd like to explain. Well, sir, you see, I was getting bored, and just for something to do I thought I'd look through the screen. Not that I dreamed of seeing anything. The instruments weren't adjusted either, and there was something funny, something I couldn't exactly make out. Go on, said Captain Weber patiently. So I fixed up the instruments and took another look, and there it was, sir, plain as could be. There what was? A city, sir. Oh, I couldn't tell much about it, but there were houses, all right, a lot of them. Houses, you say? Yes, sir, on an asteroid. Captain Weber looked for a long moment at Mr. Friden, and began to pace nervously. I take it you know what this might mean. Yes, sir, I do. That's why I wanted Lieutenant Peterson to tell you about it. I believe, Friden, that before we do any more talking, I'll see this city for myself. Captain Weber, Lieutenant Peterson, and Mr. Friden walked from the room down a long corridor and into a smaller room. Captain Weber put his eye on a circular glass and tapped his foot. He stepped back and rubbed his cheek again. Well, you were right. That is a city, or else we've all gone crazy. Do you think that we have? I don't know, sir. It's not impossible. Lieutenant, go ask Mr. Milton if he can land us on an asteroid. Give him all the details and be back in ten minutes, Captain Weber sighed. Whatever it is, he said, it will be a relief. Although I never made a special announcement, I suppose you knew that we were lost. Oh, yes, sir. And that we ran almost entirely out of fuel several months ago. In fact, shortly after we left? We knew that. The men were silent. Sir, Mr. Milton says he can land us, but he can't promise exactly where. Tell Mr. Milton that's good enough. Captain Weber waited for the young man to leave, then looked again into the glass. What do you make of it, sir? Not much, Friden, not much. It's a city, and it's an asteroid. But how the devil they got there is beyond me. I still haven't left the idea that we're crazy, you know. Friden looked. We're positioning to land. Strange. What is it? I can make out things a bit more clearly now, sir. Those are earth houses. Mr. Weber looked. He blinked. Now, that, he said, is impossible. Look here. We've been floating about in space for how long is it? Three months, sir. Exactly. For three months we've been bobbling aimlessly millions of miles from Earth. No hope, no hope whatever. And now we're landing in a city just like the one we first left, or almost like it. Friden, I ask you, does that make any sense at all? No, sir. And it doesn't seem logical that there should be an asteroid where no asteroid should be. It does not. They stared at the glass by turns. Do you see that, Friden? I'm afraid so, sir. A lake. A lake and a house by it, and trees. Tell me, how many of us are left? 
Redan held up his right hand and began to unbend fingers. Yourself, sir, and myself, Lieutenant Peterson, Mr. Chitterwick, Mr. Goblin, Mr. Milton, and Great Scott out of thirty men? You know how it was, sir, that business with the Martians, and then our own difficulties? Yes, our own difficulties. Isn't it ironic somehow, Friden? We band together and fly away from war, and no sooner are we off the earth but we begin other wars. I've often felt that if Appleton hadn't been so aggressive with that gun, we would never have been kicked off Mars. And why did we have to laugh at them? Oh, I'm afraid I haven't been a very successful captain. You're in a mood, sir. Am I? I suppose I am. Look, there's a farm, an actual farm. Not really. Why, I haven't seen one for twenty years. The door flew open, and Lieutenant Peterson came in, panting. Mr. Milton checked off every instruction, sir, and we're going down now. He sure there's enough fuel left for the break? He thinks so, sir. Lieutenant Peterson. Yes, sir. Come look into this glass, will you? The young man looked. What do you see? A lot of strange creatures, sir. Are they dangerous? Should we prepare our weapons? How old are you, Lieutenant? Nineteen, Captain Weber. You have just seen a herd of cows, for the most part. Captain Weber squinted and twirled the knobs. Holsteins. Holsteins, sir? You may go. Oh, you might tell the others to prepare for a crash landing. Straps and all that. The young man smiled faintly and left. I'm a little frightened, Friden. I think I'll go to my cabin. Take charge and have them wait for my orders. Captain Weber saluted tiredly and walked back down the long corridor. He paused as the machine suddenly roared more life, rubbing his cheek, and went into the small room. "'Cows,' said Captain Weber, bracing himself. The fiery leg fell into the cool air, heating it, causing it to smoke, and burnt into the green grass and licked a craterous hole. There were fire flags and fire sparks, hisses and explosions, and the weary groaning sound of a great beast suddenly roused from sleep. The rocket landed. It grumbled and muttered for a while on its finny tripod, then was silent. Soon the heat vanished also. "'Are you all right, sir?' "'Yes. And the rest?' "'All but Mr. Chitterwick. He broke his glasses and said he can't see.' Captain Weber swung himself erect and tested his limbs. "'Well, then, Lieutenant, has the atmosphere been checked?' The air is pure and fit to breathe, sir. Instruct the others to drop the ladder. Yes, sir. A door on the side of the rocket opened, laboriously, and men climbed out. Look, said Mr. Milton, pointing. There are trees and grass. Over there, little bridges going over the water. He pointed to a row of small white houses with green gardens and stony paths. Beyond the trees was a brick lodge extended over a rivulet which foamed and bubbled. Fishing poles protruded from the lodge window. And there, to the right, a steel building thirty stories high with a pink cloud near the top, and, separated by a hedge, a brown tent with a barbecue pit before it, smoke rising in a rigid ribbon from the chimney. Mr. Chitterwick blinked and squinted his eyes. What do you see? Distant and near, houses of stone and brick and wood, painted all colors, small and large, and further, golden fields of wheat, each blown by a different breeze in a different direction. I don't believe it, said Captain Weber. It's a park, millions of miles away from where a park could possibly be. Strange but familiar, said Lieutenant Peterson, picking up a rock. Captain Weber looked in all directions. We were lost. Then we see a city where no city should be, on an asteroid not shown in any chart, and we managed to land. And now we're in the middle of a place that belongs in history records. We may be crazy. We may all be wandering around in space and dreaming. A little man with thin hair, 
who had just stepped briskly from a tree clump, said, Well, well, and the men jumped. The little man smiled. Aren't you a trifle late or early or something? Captain Weber turned, and his mouth dropped open. I hadn't been expecting you, gentlemen, to be perfectly honest, the little man clucked. Then, oh, dear, see what you've done to Mr. Belfont's park? I do hope that you haven't hurt him. No, I see that he is all right. Captain Weber followed the direction of the man's eyes and perceived an old man with red hair seated at the base of a tree, apparently reading a book. We are from Earth, said Captain Weber. Yes, yes. Let me explain. My name is Weber. These are my men. Of course, said the little man. Chitterwick came closer, blinking. Who is this that knows our language? he asked. Who? Graypool. Uh, Mr. Graypool, didn't they tell you? Are you also from Earth? Heavens, yes. But now let us go where we can chat more comfortably. Mr. Graypool struck out down a small path past scorched trees and underbrush. You know, Captain, right after the last consignment, something happened to my calendar. Now, I'm competent at my job, but I'm no technician. No, indeed. Besides, no doubt one of you or your men can set the doodad right, eh? Here we are. They walked onto a wooden porch and through a door with a wire screen. Lieutenant Peterson first, then Captain Weber, Mr. Friden, and then the rest of the crew. Mr. Graypool followed. You must forgive me, it's been a while. Take chairs. There, there. Now, what's the news of home, shall I say? The little man stared. Captain Weber shifted uncomfortably. He glanced about the room at the lace curtain and the needlepoint tapestries and the lavender wallpaper. Mr. Graypool, I'd like to ask some questions. Certainly, certainly. But first, this being an occasion, the little man stared at each man carefully, then shook his head. Ah, uh, do you all like wine? Good wine? He ducked through a small door. Captain Weber exhaled and rose. Now, don't start talking all at once, he whispered. Anyone have any ideas? No? Then quick, scout around. Friden, you stay here. You others, see what you can find. I'm not sure I like the look of this. The men left the room. Mr. Chitterwick made his way along a hedgerow, feeling cautiously and maintaining a delicate balance. When he came to a doorway, he stopped, squinted, and entered. The room was dark and quiet and odorous. Mr. Chitterwick groped a few steps, put out his hand, and encountered what seemed to be raw flesh. He swiftly withdrew his hand. Excuse, he said, then, oh, as his face came against a slab of moist red meat, oh, my! Mr. Chitterwick began to tremble, and he blinked furiously, reaching out and finding flesh, cold and hard, unidentifiable. When he stepped upon the toes of a large man with a walrus mustache, he wheeled, located the sunlight, and ran from the butcher shop. The door of the temple opened with difficulty, which caused Mr. Milton to breathe unnaturally. Then, once again, he gasped row upon row of people, their fingers outstretched, lips opened but immobile and silent, their bodies prostrate on the floor. And upon a strange black altar, a tiny woman with silver hair and a long theresis in her right hand, nothing stirred but the mosaic squares in the walls. The colors danced here. Otherwise, everything was frozen, everything was solid. Even the air hung suspended, stationary. Mr. Milton left the temple. There was a table, and a woman on the table, and people all around the woman on the table. Mr. Goblin did not go a great distance from the doorway. He rubbed his eyes and stared. It was an operating room. There were all the instruments, some old, most old, and masked men and women with shining scissors and glistening saws in their hands and up above the students' aperture, filled seats, filled aisles. 
Mr. Goblin put his other hand about the doorknob. A large man stood over the recumbent figure, his lusterless eyes regarding the crimson puce incision, but he did not move. The nurses did not move, or the students. No one moved, especially the smiling middle-aged woman on the table. Mr. Goblin moved. Hello, said Lieutenant Peterson after he had searched through eight long aisles of books. Hello? He pointed his gun menacingly. There were many books, with many titles, and they all had a fine gray dust about them. Lieutenant Peterson paused to examine a bulky volume, when he happened to look above him. "'Who are you?' he demanded. The mottled, angular man perched atop the ladder did not respond. He clutched a book, and looked at the book, and not at the lieutenant. "'Come down. I want to talk with you.' The man on the ladder did nothing unusual. He remained precisely as he had been. Lieutenant Peterson climbed up the ladder, scowling. He reached the man, and jabbed with a finger. Lieutenant Peterson looked into the eyes of the reading man and descended hastily, and did not say good-bye. Mr. Graypool re-entered the living room with a tray of glasses. "'This is apricot wine,' he announced, and distributed the glasses. "'But where are the others? Out for a walk?' Ah, well, they can drink theirs later. Incidentally, Captain, how many guests did you bring? Last time it was only twelve. Not an extraordinary shipment, either. They all preferred the ordinary things. All but Mrs. Dominguez. Dear me, she was worth the carload herself. Wanted a zoo, can you imagine? A regular zoo. But... A regular zoo, with her put in the birdhouse. Oh, they had a time getting that one up. Mr. Graypool chuckled and sipped at his drink. It's people like Mrs. Dominguez who put the, the life, into happy glades. Or do you find that disrespectful? Captain Weber shook his head and tossed down his drink. Mr. Graypool leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs. Ah, he continued, you have no idea how good this is. Once in a while it does get lonely for me here. No man is an island, or how does it go? Why, I can remember when Mr. Waldemeyer first told me of this idea. A grave responsibility, he said, a grave responsibility. Mr. Waldemeyer has a keen sense of humor, needless to say. Captain Weber looked out the window. A small child on roller skates stood still on the sidewalk. Mr. Graypool laughed. Finished your wine? Good. Explanations are in order, though first perhaps you'd care to join me in a brief turn around the premises. Fine. Friedan, you stay here and wait for the man. Captain Weber winked a number of times and frowned briefly. Then he and Mr. Graypool walked out onto the porch and down the steps. Mr. Friedan drummed his fingers upon the arm of the chair, surveyed his empty glass, and hiccuped softly. I do wish you'd landed your ship elsewhere, Captain. Mr. Belfont is quite particular, and, as you see, his park is hopelessly disfigured. We were given no choice, I'm afraid. The fuel was running out. Indeed. Well, then, that explains everything. A beautiful day, don't you find, sir? Fortunately, with the exception of Professor Carling, all the guests prefer good weather. Plenty of sunshine, they say, or crisp evenings. It helps. They walked toward the house of colored rocks. Miss Daphne Trillings, Mr. Graypool gestured. They threw it up in a day, though it's solid enough. When they passed an elderly woman on a bicycle, Captain Weber stopped walking. Mr. Graypool, we've got to have a talk. Mr. Graypool shrugged and pointed, and they went to an office building, which was crowded with motionless men, women, and children. Since I'm so mixed up myself, the captain said, maybe I'd better ask. Just who do you think we are? I'd thought you to be the men from the glades, of course. I don't have the slightest idea of what you're talking about. We're from the planet Earth. They were going to have another war, the last war, they said, and we escaped in that rocket and started off for Mars. But something went wrong. A fellow named Appleton pulled a gun, 
Others just didn't like the Martians. We needn't go into it. They wouldn't have us, so Mars didn't work out. Something else went wrong then. Soon we were lost, with only a little store of fuel and supplies. Then Mr. Friden noticed this city, or whatever it is, and we had enough fuel to land, so we landed. Mr. Graypool nodded his head slowly, somehow sadder than before. I see. You say there was a war on Earth? They were going to set off X-bomb. When they do, everything will go to pieces. Or everything has already. What dreadful news! May I inquire, Captain, when you have learned where you are, what do you intend to do? Why, live here, of course. No, no, try to understand. You could not conceivably fit in here with us. Captain Weber glanced at the motionless people. Why not? Then he shouted. What is this place? Where am I? Graypool smiled. Captain, you're in a cemetery. Good work, Peterson. Thanks, sir. When we all got back and Friden didn't know where you'd gone, well, we got worried. Then we heard you shouting. Hold his arms. There. You heard this, Friden? Mr. Friden was trembling slightly. He brushed past the man with the Van Dyke beard and sat down on a leather stool. Yes, sir, I did. That is, I think I did. What shall we do with him? I don't know yet. Take him away. Lieutenant, for now I want to think a bit. We'll talk to Mr. Graypool later on. Lieutenant Peterson pulled the smiling little man out into the street and pointed a gun at him. Mr. Chitterwick blinked into the face of a small child. Man's insane, I guess, said Mr. Milton, pacing. Yes, but what about all this? Mr. Goblin looked horrified at the stationary people. I think I can tell you, Mr. Friedan said. Take a look, Captain. The men crowded around a pamphlet which Mr. Friedan had placed on the stool. Toward the top of the pamphlet, and in the center of the first page, was a photograph, untinted and solemn. It depicted a white cherub delicately poised on a granite slab. Beneath the photographs were the words, Happy Glaze. Captain Weber turned the pages and mumbled, glancing over his shoulder every once in a while. What is it, sir? asked Mr. Chitterwick of the frozen man in the blue suit with the copper buttons. It's one of those old-level cemeteries, cried Mr. Milton. I remember seeing pictures like it, sir. Captain Weber read aloud from the pamphlet. For fifty years, he began, an outstanding cultural and spiritual asset to this community, Happy Glades is proud to announce yet another innovation in its program of post-benefits. Now you can enjoy the afterlife in surroundings which suggest the here and now. Never before in history has scientific advancement allowed such a plan. Captain Weber turned the page. For those who prefer that their late departed have real, permanent, eternal happiness, for those who are dismayed by the fragility of all things mortal, we of Happy Glades are proud to offer 1. The permanent duplication of physical conditions identical to those enjoyed by the departed on Earth. Park, playground, lodge, office building, hotel, or house, etc., may be secured at varying prices. All workmanship and materials specifically attuned to the conditions on asteroid K-7 and guaranteed for permanence. 2. Permanent conditioning of late beloved so that, in the midst of the surroundings he favored, a genuine eternity may be assured. 3. Full details on Happy Glade's newest property, asteroid K-7, may be found on page 4. The captain tossed the pamphlet on the floor and lit a cigarette. Did anyone happen to notice the date? Mr. Milton said, It doesn't make any sense. There haven't been cemeteries for ages. And even if this were true, why would anyone want to go all the way through space to a little asteroid? They might just as well have built these things on Earth. Who would want all this when they're dead anyway? You mean all these people are dead? For a few moments there was complete and utter silence in the lobby of the building. Are those things true that we read in your booklet? asked Captain Weber, 
after Lieutenant Peterson had brought in the prisoner? Every word, said the little man, bowing slightly, is monumentally correct. Then we want you to begin explaining. Mr. Graypool tushed and proceeded to straighten the coat of a middle-aged man with a cigar. Mr. Goblin shuddered. No, no, laughed Mr. Graypool. These are only imitations. Mr. Conklin upstairs was head of a large firm, absolutely in love with his work, you know, that kind of thing. So we had to duplicate not only the office, but the building, and even replicas of all the people in the building. Mr. Conklin himself is in an easy chair on the twentieth story. And? Well, gentlemen, as you know, Happy Glades is an outstanding mortuary on Earth. And to put it briefly, with the constant exploration of planets and moons and what not, our Mr. Waldemeyer hit upon this scheme seeking to extend the ideal hereafter to our guests, we bought out this little asteroid. With a vast volume and tremendous turnover, as it were, we got our staff of scientists together, and they offered this plan, to duplicate the exact surroundings which the guest most enjoyed in life, assuring him privacy, permanence, a very big point, as you can see, and all the small things not possible on Earth. Why here? Why cart off a million miles or more when the same thing could have been done on Earth? My communication system went bad, I fear, so I haven't heard from the offices in a while. But am I to understand there is a war beginning? That is the idea, Captain. One could never really be sure of oneself down there, what with all the new bombs and things being discovered. Hmm, said Captain Weber. Then, too, Mr. Waldemeyer worried about those new societies, with their dreadful ideas about cremation. You can see what that sort of thing could do to the undertaking business. His plan caught on, however, and soon we were having to turn away guests. And where do you fit in, Mr. Graypool? The little man seemed to blush. He lowered his eyes. I was the head caretaker, you see, but I wasn't well. Gastric complaints, liver, heart, palpitations this and that. So I decided to allow them to change me. They turned all manner of machines on my body and pumped me full of fluids, and by the time I got here, why, I was almost, you might say, a machine myself. Fortunately, though, they left a good deal of gray pool. All I know is that whenever the film is punctured, I wake and become a machine, do my prescribed duties in a complex way, and the film? The covering that seals in the conditioning. Nothing can get out, nothing get in, except things like rockets. Then it's self-sealing, needless to say. But to get on, Captain, with all the technical advancements, it soon got to where there was no real work to be done here. They threw up the film and coated us with their preservative, or, as they put it, Eternifier. And, well, with the exception of my calendar and the communication system, everything's worked perfectly, including myself. No one said anything for a while. Then Captain Weber said, with great slowness, You're lying. This is all a crazy, hideous plot. The little man chuckled at the word plot. In the first place, no cemetery or form of cemetery has existed on earth for how long, Frieden? Mr. Frieden stared at his fingers. Years and years. Exactly. There are communal furnaces now. Mr. Graypool winced. And furthermore, continued the captain, this whole concept is ridiculous. Mr. Chitterwick threw down the pamphlet and began to tremble. We should have stayed home, he remarked to a young woman who did not answer. Mr. Graypool, said Weber, I think that you know more than you're saying. You didn't seem very surprised when you learned we weren't the men you expected. You don't seem very surprised now when I tell you that your happy Glen and all the people connected with it have been dead for ages. So why the display of interest in our explanations? Why? A faint murmur. A good machine checks and double checks, could be heard from Mr. Graypool, who otherwise said nothing. I speak for my men. We're confused terribly confused. But whatever this is, we're stuck, can't you see? 
All we want is a place to begin again. Captain Weber paused and looked at the others, and went on in a softer tone. We're tired men, Mr. Graypool. We're poorly equipped, but we do have weapons, and if this is some hypnotic kind of trap... The little man waved his hands, offendedly. There are lakes and farms, all we need to make a new start. More than we'd hoped for, much more. What had you hoped for, Captain? Something, nothing, just escape. But I see no women. How could you begin again, as you suggest? Women? Too weak. They would not have lasted. We brought along eggs and machines, enough for our needs. Graypool clucked his tongue. Mr. Waldemeyer certainly did look ahead, he muttered. He certainly did. Will we be honest now? Will you help us? Yes, Captain, I will help you. Let us go back to your rocket, Mr. Graypool smiled. Things will be better there. Captain Weber signaled. They left the building and walked by the foot of the great white mountain. They passed a garden with little spotted trees and flowers, a brown desert of shifting sands and a striped tent. They walked by strawberry fields and airplane hangars and coal mines, tiny yellow cottages, cramped apartments, fluted houses and Tudor homes, and homes without description. Past rock pools and a great zoo full of animals that stared out with vacant eyes, and everywhere the seasons changed gently. Crisp autumn, cottony summer, windy spring, and winters cool and white. The six men in uniform followed the little man with the thin hair. They did not speak as they walked, but looked around, staring, craning, wondering. And the old, young, middle-aged, white, brown, yellow people who did not move wondered back at the men with their eyes. You see, Captain, the success of Mr. Waldmeyer's plan? Captain Weber rubbed his cheek. I don't understand, he said. But you do see, all of you, the perfection here, the quality of eternal happiness, which the circular speaks of? Yes, we see that. Here we have happiness and brotherhood. Here there have never been wars or hatreds or prejudices. And now you who were many and left earth to escape war and hatred, who were many by your own word and are now only six, you want to begin life here? Cross breezes ruffled the man's hair. To begin, when from the moment of your departure you had wars of your own, and killed, and hurled mocking prejudice against a race of people not like you, a race who rejected and cast you out into space again, from your own account. No, gentlemen, I am truly sorry. It may be that I misjudge those of you who are left, or rather, that happy glades misjudged you, you may mean well, after all. And, of course, the location on this asteroid is so planned by the board as to be uncharted forever. But, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Graypool sighed. What does he mean by that? asked Mr. Frighten and Lieutenant Peterson. Captain Weber was gazing at a herd of cows in the distance. What do you mean you're sorry? demanded Mr. Frighten. Well, Captain Weber, cried Mr. Chitterwick blankly, Yes, yes. I feel queer. Mr. Goblin clutched his stomach. So do I. And me. Captain Weber looked back at the field, then at Mr. Graypool. His mouth twitched in sudden pain. We feel awful, Captain. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Follow me to your ship, quickly. Mr. Graypool motioned curiously with his hand and began to step quickly. They circled a small pond where a motionless boy strained toe-high on an extended board, and the day once again turned to night as they hurried past the shadowed cathedral. When they were in sight of the scorched trees, Mr. Milton doubled up and screamed, Captain! Mr. Goblin struck his forehead. I told you, I told you we shouldn't have drunk that wine. Didn't I tell you? It was the wine. We all drank it. He did it. He poisoned us. Follow me, cried Mr. Graypool, making a hurried gesture and breaking into a run. Faster! They stumbled hypnotically through the park and over the Mandarin bridges to the rock. Tell them, Captain. Tell them to climb the ladder. 
Go on up, men. But we're poisoned, sir. Hurry, there's an antidote on the ship. The crew climbed into the ship. Captain, invited Mr. Graypool. Captain Weber ascended jerkily. When he reached the open lock, he turned. His eyes swept over the hills and fields and mountains, over the rivers and houses and still people. He coughed and pulled himself into the rocket. Mr. Graypool followed. You don't dislike this ship, do you? That is, the surroundings are not offensive? No, we don't dislike the ship. I'm glad of that. If only I had been allowed more latitude. But everything functions so well here. No real choice in the matter, actually. No more than the ceiling fell. And they would leave me with these human emotions. I see, of course, why the communication system doesn't work, and why my calendar is out of commission. Kind of Mr. Waldemeyer to arrange that they stop when his worst fears finally materialize. Are the men all seated? No, no, they mustn't writhe on the floor like that. Get them to their stations. No, to the stations they would most prefer, and hurry. Captain Weber ordered Chitterwick to the galley, Mr. Goblin to the engineering chair, Mr. Fryden to the navigator's room. Sir, what's going to happen? Where's the antidote? Mr. Milton to the pilot's chair. The pain will only last for a moment or so. It's an unfortunate part of the Eternifier, said Mr. Graypool. There, all in order? Good, good. Now, Captain, I see understanding in your face, and it pleases me more than I can say. Your position is so difficult. But you can see that the machine is geared to its job, which is to retain permanence on happy glades. Well, a machine is a machine. Where shall we put you? Captain Weber leaned on the arm of the little man and walked to the open lock. You do understand, asked Mr. Graypool. Captain Weber's heads nodded halfway down then stopped, his eyes frozen forever on the city. A pity. The little man with the thin hair walked around the cabins and rooms, straightening, dusting. He climbed down the ladder, shook his head, and started down the path to the wooden house. When he had washed all the empty glasses and replaced them, he sat down in a large leather chair and adjusted himself into the most comfortable position. His eyes stared in waxing contentment at the homely interior, with its lavender wallpaper, needlepoint tapestries, and tidy arrangement. He did not move. The End of Elegy by Charles Beaumont Half Past Alligator by Donald Colvin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. It takes sportsmanship to make a ball team, and foul play to get a backward race civilized. Half Past Alligator by Donald Colvin. Bill Bradley shooed away the group of Quexus that had surged over the first base line. With broad grins on their flat, piebald faces, they moved away in the wrong direction, of course, and squatted in a smiling semicircle around Pat Reed, who was playing third. This was bad, because Reed was a 50-50 player. It was an even chance whether he got the ball, or the ball got him. One of the half-domesticated thrags broke loose and cantered across the outfield with its peculiar five-legged gait. In the hubbub, Ray Bush stole second. Nobody seemed to notice. Sighing heavily, Bill returned to the mound and whiplashed a fast one tight across the letters. The hitter got only a small piece of it. A pop fly sauntered toward left field. Judging it to a nicety, Gus Mustus came racing in, evading a tethered thrag, leapt a hole some Quaxa had dug and forgotten, and made a shoestring catch, retiring the side. The Quexas cheered deliriously. Bill trotted off the mound. For a moment, the thrill of the game held him. This was the way things should be. The feel of smoothly flowing muscles, the thudding sound of horsehide hitting a leather glove, the weight of a bat in your hands in your first ball game after clamoring over 
and scrabbling in an unexplored planet for fourteen months. Then he caught sight of Candace Matthews, walking among the Numo huts that served as the outpost camp for the expedition. Gloom enveloped him again, surrounding him like a dank fog. For fourteen long months Bill had feasted on the memory of Candy Matthews, on his recollection of her turquoise eyes and cascading brown hair, on the remembrance of her soft lips on his last night under the four moons of Vincer III. Today she had arrived with the seventy-odd men and women who comprised the appraisal unit, the final group of the planet's explorers. He had looked forward like a schoolboy to her coming, and, like a schoolboy, he had suffered black despair when his dreams were shattered, for the Candy Matthews who got off the shuttle bug at Camp Outpost was not the Candy Matthews who had said soft words on Vincer Three. She was, instead, a self-assured young woman, somehow harder, who felt only an indifferent tolerance toward the tall young man named Bill Bradley, and the all-consuming, hero-worshipping infatuation for a newcomer, a dapper walking brain, Vance Montgomery, one of the council's smart boys, with the title of planet evaluator. He's simply wonderful, she had said, and the joy of life had gone out of Bill Bradley. The appraisal group brought in athletic equipment, and Bill's men spontaneously declared a holiday, their first on the planet. Baseball was the order of the afternoon, and they shanghaied a not unwilling Bill to pitch. He should, he knew, be laying out reports for Montgomery to study. He did not particularly want to be with Montgomery. He sat on the Yextel log that served as a bench. One Quexa was bent over examining first base. He made a colorful sight. The first baseman slapped him jovially on the loincloth to move him. The owner of the thrag caught up to it, and was struggling manfully to lead it away. The five-legged beast defied his efforts, rearing and dragging him. A dozen Quexas stood nearby. Their sympathies were obviously with their fellow Quexa, but they made no move to help him. Reed was on the bench next to Bill. He had come in with the appraisal group. Your vivid friends, he said, cocking a thumb at the Quexa, don't appear too bright. They're smart enough, said Bill, almost as intelligent as we are. It's just that they've never risen above a herd culture. Look, said Reed, I'm a silviculturalist. Give me a hunk of wood and I'll tell you how long it took to grow, what it's good for, where it can be raised, and how much board and profit can be made out of it. But this kind of talk throws me. Try another wavelength. Socially, they're like seals or penguins back on Earth. They like to gather in groups. The things they can do individually, they do well. But they don't know how to help each other. That's beyond them. Don't understand the meaning of cooperation? The word isn't even in their language. I've seen forty of them standing around, fretting and stewing, while the Horels killed off one of their fellows. What are Horels? The other dominant life form here. Nasty brutes, like big upright ants with tentacles, standing about as high as my chest. Most malignant thing I've ever seen. One Quexa can handle any Horel, maybe even two or three. But the Horels hunt in packs. Goodbye, Quexa. Killing them off, are they? This is the last big concentration the Quexas have left. In another hundred years, there'll be no more Quexas. They looked again at the natives. The Quexas were something to see, human in form, although somewhat shorter than Earthmen. Their skins were blotched and dashed with patches of vivid colors. Antiquarians talked of their resemblance to the ancient circus clowns, a likeness furthered by their broad, flat faces and habitual grins. Sort of hate to see them disappear, Bill said glumly. They're happy, good-natured creatures. In their whole race I know only one who's mean. We've done our best to help them. But if they don't cooperate, even in a matter of life and death, what incentive can you offer them? An elbow dug into him. Up to the platter, dear boy, said Gus Must. A hit means two runs. Selecting a bat, Bill made his way to the plate. 
In the middle distance, Vance Montgomery emerged from a hut. Candy went to him eagerly, put a hand on his arm. A deep rage engulfed Bill. The first pitch was a curve that failed to break. As it came flatly over the plate, Bill swung angrily. The ball rocketed up and away, past the infield, over the head of the desperately running left fielder, and dropped toward a sure home run. Then a curious thing happened. One of the Quexes darted away from the gabbling group along the foul line, his short legs churning over the uneven ground. As the ball sank, he dove, plucked it out of the air with one broad hand, turning a somersault, and came up with it, grinning. It was an impossible catch, and the Earthmen joined the Quexes in applause. Still clinging to the ball, the Quexa made little bobbing bows of acknowledgment. "'Throw it in!' shouted Bill. The Quexa stood motionless. "'Throw it in, Adla!' he urged. He went through the throwing motion. The Quexa nodded comprehension. He went into a violent wind-up. His left foot came up, his upper body went back, his right arm snapped in an arc. The ball flew from his hand, straight and fast in the wrong direction, of course. The pack of Quexes pelted after it, shouting, picked it up, and threw it again. To his surprise, Bill found himself pounding after them, bawling fruitless pleas, aware that he looked foolish, but in his rage, not caring. He closed in on them on the fifth throw, and his fingertips touched the ball. He succeeded only in deflecting it. There was a dull thunk, and the game was over. The ball had struck Vince Montgomery, planted evaluator, squarely in the left eye. Three things were said then to Bill Bradley. One was by Montgomery, as he handed back the ball. I was not aware, Bradley, that the job of camp leader entailed joining the rowdyism of the native races. One was by Candy Matthews, hopping with anger. You're a barbarian, Bill Bradley. Monty might have been badly hurt. The third was by a clod of Quexus, crowding eagerly. Play ball! Bill Brad, more play ball! To the first two, Bill did not reply. To the Quexus, he said one word, Nuts! And dolefully followed Montgomery into the headquarters hut. In spite of his natural prejudice against Montgomery, Bill was forced into a reluctant admiration for the way the man worked. Montgomery's task was to recommend whether the planet should be marked for immediate colonization, placed on a reserve list for future expansion, or to be left strictly alone, as unworthy of occupancy. He tore through Bill's reports like a small child through a bag of jelly beans. His questions, if pompous, were pointed. Within twenty-four hours, ready to leave for the main camp, he called a conference. He stood before the group, as dapper as a man can be with a rainbow bruise under one eye, complacently listening to the resonance of his own voice. Beside him, Candy nodded worshipful agreement. Bill grumped in a corner. For a full forty-five minutes, Montgomery outlined additional data he wanted gathered. His voice was faintly chiding, implying by its tone that anybody but a dolt would have obtained the information long ago. And now, he said, we come to the question of the humanoid denizens of this planet, the so-called Quaxus. He fingered his black eye. Many persons might conclude that the Quaxus are not worth saving, and in themselves they are not. However, my preliminary conclusion, based unfortunately on insufficient data, lead me to believe that this planet will be used for colonization in about five hundred years. It would be very convenient, then, to have the dominant life-form friendly to the galactic humans and capable of being integrated with the colonists. Some method of preserving the Quaxus must therefore be worked out. In this, the advance group has failed lamentably. He paused, glanced around triumphantly. How do I propose to achieve this? By a historical method. What do nations do when they are in peril? They call upon a single man, place themselves under him, and let him lead them out. When the ancient Western civilization was in its greatest danger after the fall of Rome, 
the people gathered around the strong men, made them kings and dukes and earls, and were saved from barbarism. I shall do the same for the Quaxus. The Quaxus shall have a king. His eyes sought out Bill. My acquaintance here has been short. I must rely on advice. Bradley, whom would you recommend for king of the Quaxus? Well, said Bill slowly, Moalo is the most intelligent. He's good-natured and kindly. He has a lot of artistic ability. Some of his carvings are being taken back for the Galactic Folk Museum. An artist, said Montgomery in disgust. Well, let's have a look at him. Moalo was finishing a figurine near one of the meandering paths that the Quaxa had worn by habit, not design. A bemused group of natives looked on admiringly. Down the path came Retaka, the biggest of the Quaxas, his shoulders proudly back, his face set in a truculent scowl. Bill knew and disliked him, and apprehensively felt sure that the peaceful scene would be destroyed. Alone, of an amiable, tolerant race, Rataka was perpetually ill-tempered, the rankling product of Lord knew what alien genetic accident or trauma. Rataka found his path obstructed by the carving. Callously, he brought his foot down on the delicate figurine, crushing it into splinters. Moalo sprang up in gentle protest. Rataka gave him the back of a meaty hand that knocked him off his feet. Two spectators indicated disapproval. Rataka smashed their heads together and strode on. "'To save a culture, Bradley,' said Montgomery, who was watching the brutal display with admiration. "'You need strength, not delicacy or feeling. That man shall be the king of the Quaxes. He ran after Rataka. The members of the outpost staff looked at Bill in dismay. He shrugged sadly and walked out of the headquarters hut. At the doorway, Adla'a was waiting for him, with the same old plea. "'Play ball?' he begged. "'More play ball, Bill Brad?' In his despondent mood, Bill did not care. "'All right, I'll throw the ball to you. You throw it back to me.' "'Quaxa not do that.' "'It is just as much fun to throw the ball in one direction as it is in any other direction,' Bill explained patiently. Unless you throw it back, forget it. No play ball. Adla'a thought seriously. Hunky dokey. What play ball? They were tossing it back and forth in the middle of a cheering group, when a half track passed, taking Montgomery, Candy, and Rataka to the main camp. The look that the girl gave Bill was disdainful. "'There's a gaggle of natives outside in assorted shades,' said Pat Reed the next day. "'They want to play ball. Moalo's at their head. He carved a bat. "'Tell him to beat it. We're busy. "'Let's give em some fun while we can. "'They won't enjoy life much after King Rat comes back here.' "'That's the truth,' Bill agreed. "'All right.' I wish your painted idiots would get over their baseball mania, complained Rudy Peters, the mineralogist, two days later. Look me over carefully, will you, Bill? I think my throwing arm just dropped off. They're nutty about it all right, Bill Bradley said. Too bad it couldn't have been about something with some economic value. Economic value the man wants. Okay, I'll talk economic value to you. Bet you fifty units I can make a better ball team out of these freaks than you can. Well, make it thirty. You're on, sucker. I've lined up the sweetest shortstop that ever spit in a glove. Here's your thirty, said Rudy Peters a week after. How was I to know the shortstop wouldn't throw the ball to anyone except the center fielder? Team plays the stuff, lad, said Bill Bradley. Stress team play. Twenty-five. Twenty-seven, twenty-nine, thirty. Exactly right. Another lesson at the same price? He was refused, but never on an exploration had Bill Bradley had so much fun, and never, he reminded himself grimly, had he got so little work done. The Quexa were neglecting their skimpy food plots in their eagerness to play. They were getting lean. Finally, with reluctance, 
Bill called a temporary halt to baseball. Bill Brad says no baseball till work done, said Moalo, sadly to Adla. Sometimes Bill Brad talked like Southpaw Pitcher. Adla was trying to cultivate his food plot with the help of a thrag. The beast was of an independent mind. It dragged Adla in eccentric ovals, in defiance of agricultural needs. Adla want finish work, play ball, the Quexel commented. Thrag no play baseball, say nuts to work. Adla be old like old Hoss Radborn before work done. Moalo contemplated. Adla have trouble his thrag. Moalo have trouble his. Moalo help Adla his thrag, and Adla help Moalo his. Get work done more faster. Adla dismissed the revolutionary thought. Quaxes not do. We play baseball rundown play, argued Moalo. Play together. You throw ball me, I throw ball you. Yippee, man out. Same team, old pals. Want to sing team song? Want to play team with Thrag? Adla considered the matter in this new light. Like baseball gang, he said at last in amazement. Sure, you, me, be us together. Make Thrag look like Busher. They both took hold of the Thrag. Unable to resist their combined strengths, the beast submitted docilely. They began to work. Glancing out from his labor in the headquarters Numo hut, Bill saw the incident in happy surprise. Perhaps, after all, his stay here might produce something to help the culture that Montgomery would introduce upon his return. He had no doubt of Montgomery's success. Neither, for that matter, had Montgomery. At the main camp, things were going swimmingly. The camp lay on the very fringe of Quaxa territory. But, by an arduous hunt, Ritaka had captured eight wandering Quaxas, to whom he immediately set about teaching the duties of subjects. His method was simple. The Quaxas followed his orders, which he obtained from Montgomery, or the Quaxa was knocked down. If he still refused, he was knocked down again. Within three weeks, Ritaka had them doing things no Quaxas ever had done before. They performed them reluctantly and sullenly, but they did them. Seeing the result, but not the means, Candy was enthusiastic. They're working together, she cried. Oh, Monty, what will the Quixes do to reward you? Oh, they'll probably make a culture god of me, said Montgomery, managing to look modest, like the Greeks did with that Martian, Prom Satha, who taught them to use fire. As time went on, though, the girl began to have doubts. But they're doing everything for Ritaka, she protested. As far as they're concerned themselves, they're more wretched than before. That's the way feudal cultures are built, my dear, Montgomery assured her. The king gives them law and a fighting leader. In return, the subjects take care of his bodily comfort. But they look so unhappy. In saving an inferior race, we cannot be concerned too much about the happiness of a few miserable members. Perhaps in three hundred years or so, they can afford happiness. And finally an incident happened to complete her disillusionment. One of Ritaka's morose subjects managed to slip the shackles with which he had been bound at night and make a bolt for freedom. The king pursued him relentlessly, brought him back, then beat him, coldly and cruelly, slugging and gouging and kicking. Ashen-faced, Candy moved to interfere. Montgomery restrained her. We're saving a race, he said. You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Candy turned and ran sobbing to her quarters, unable to dispel the memory of the writhing body on the ground. The next day was the day to move equipment. It was a policy of the expeditions to leave their worn-out machines for the most friendly of the native races, who could dismantle them, and use the parts. The equipment not worth toting back to Earth was to be taken to the advance camp where the Quaxa Center was. Montgomery also planned that day to take Rataka to his kingdom. 
A few minutes ahead of the motorcade, Candy slipped out, got into a battered half-track, and started driving the eighty miles to the advance camp. For the first twenty-five miles, she told herself that her eagerness was because it was a nice day, and she wanted to get out of camp. For the next twenty-five miles, she called herself a liar. For the third twenty-five miles, she gave herself up unashamedly to thinking about Bill Bradley, his smile, his gentleness, the awkward grace of his lean body. Not a man to set a planet on fire, but how pleasant and restful to have around. She wondered if he would forgive the way she had acted. Somehow, she was sure he would. The narrow vehicular trail ran through a grove of fern-like trees. It's just over the rise, Candy thought, just over the rise and down into the saucer, where Bill is waiting. The half-track struck a rock, lurched, threw a tread, and went off the road out of control. That did not matter especially, for the Quaxes could use the materials very well where it was. Candy went forward briskly afoot. A fallen branch brushed her ankle. Unheedingly, she kicked it away. She began to reconstruct Bill, feature by feature, the way his hair swirled on his forehead, his eyebrows, arched and regular, his eyes, wide, deep-seated, with inner pools of merriment, his nose, straight and rather another branch caught her she lifted her foot to free it it did not come free another tentacle moved around her pinioning her right arm to her side she whirled in terror and found herself in the grip of the horrells there were a dozen of the horrors their antenna ears erect mandibles open they exuded an acid odor a sign of hunger candy screamed she fought to reach her pistol, strapped to her right hip. More tentacles stopped her. She screamed and screamed again, throwing her body to shake off the grip, trying to kick with her feet. There was movement in the road at the top of the rise. For a moment, elation surged in Candy, almost stiffening her. Perhaps some expedition member had hurt her, was trying to rescue her. Then she saw the newcomers were Quexels. Hope vanished leaving her limp and hollow. To be killed by these horrors was bad enough, but to be killed in the presence of a group of piebald morons who would stand and watch and moan, but not lift a hand. In her agitation she did not notice the Quexas were nine in number and wore baseball caps. They drew short clubs shaped like bats. Kill the umpire, they shouted, hatred born of diamond conflicts in their cry. Kill the umpire, they yelled and charged. In military formation, they clubbed their way through their enemies, battering and smashing until Candy was free, with a dozen dying horrells on the ground, their tentacles contracting and writhing. The Quetzal leader made his bobbling bow to her. How do, he said politely. We dip them in calcimine vat, you bet. We hang them out like wash. Now we give team yell. The Quexas put their arm around one another's shoulders. In unison they chanted, Ho tomato, ho potato, half past alligator, bum bum bulligator, chickala da, pussy cats, pussy cats, ra ra ra. Pussy cats, the leader explained to Candy, are honored animal on planet where Bill Brad is head cheese. I'll bet you play baseball nicely, Candy said. Woe broke forth on nine broad faces. Misfortunately not, confessed the captain. Thirty-three teams in Quexatown, Pussycats in thirty-third place. He brightened. Go ivory hunt now. Catch nine new Quexas. Teach em baseball. Then maybe we beat em, and not be in cellar any more. Together the team bobbed politely to Candy and trotted down the road. Happily, Candy went up the rise, then stopped in astonishment looking at Quexatown. Gone was the straggling, haphazard settlement, with the flimsy huts and unattended starvation patches where individual Quexas tried to raise their own food. Instead, building sites were laid out in straight, broad rows, and the Quexas were working, three and four in a group, raising substantial homes of timber. Others were surrounding the settlement with a wall of brambles, 
impenetrable to horals. Teams of men, two to a thrag, were ploughing, preparing large fields for tillage, and down the side of the settlement, affectionately tended, ran a line of baseball fields. Just off the road, a quexa squatted, ball cap on his head, watching a crude sundial. Nice gay for a game, he greeted Candy. Speechless with surprise, the girl made a dazed, questioning gesture toward the improvements. Bill Brad do it, the Quex informed her. He tell us how. Work one by one, he says. Work all time to fill belly. Maybe fill Horrell belly instead. Work all by all. Do more quickly. Have time in afternoon. Batter up. Sock it, boy. Wing it home. He's sliding. The sun's shadow touched a peg. Five minutes, bawled the Quexa. The laborers quit work, put away their tools. The farmers herded their thrags into a strongly constructed corral. The natives gathered in knots at the settlement's edge and looked longingly at the baseball fields. Yesterday I fooled Bill Brad, invited a Quexa. I hid ball, catch him off second. Bill Brad get all red faced and say, Never mind what Bill said, Candy interjected hastily. The shadow touched another peg. Play ball, the Quexa yelled. Play ball, play ball, play ball. He sprang up, produced a baseball glove, and spat into it reverently. I go play now. You come see. Get scorecard. No players. He looked at Candy hopefully. Especially me, he added. Out of the moil of Quexus came the lank form of Bill Bradley. He spied the girl, hooped, and came running to her. For a few moments they talked at once, in an incoherent and ecstatic jumble. Then Candy, catching control of herself, cited in admiration the change in the Quexa village. "'And you've done all this?' she concluded. "'I didn't do anything,' Bill protested. "'They like to play baseball, and this sort of happened. "'We're getting representative government into action now. "'Each team elects a captain, and the captains are the town council. "'Tonight they're going to vote on naming the settlement Brooklyn.' "'You know,' said Candy, I bet they'll make you a culture god. The tanned face of Bill Bradley took on the rose hue of a blush. Well, Moalo carved a statue, and they've put it in front of the League headquarters. That's their city hall, he admitted uncomfortably. It doesn't look much like me. I've got six arms, because they wanted me batting, pitching, and catching a ball all at the same time. Candy slipped a hand into his. Is there a place around here, she asked in a small tone, where a culture god can take a girl and, well, talk to her? Is there, said Bill. You just come with me. A heavy object bumped into him. He whirled at the touch. Oh, hi, Ritaka, he said in a flat voice. Montgomery's king had returned to his subjects. He was alone, his captives having escaped off the ride over. He was in a vile temper. Glaring evilly, he motioned at the baseball players. He was recalling an advice of Montgomery. Whatever your subjects like to do most, do it better than they can. In that way, you will get their respect and find it easier to take over. What that fool doings on, snarled Rataka. Rataka do too. Bill's already sagging spirits sank again. With Rataka's strength and reflexes, the great brute undoubtedly would become a star of stars, gathering admirers to himself, and destroying all the pleasant prospects now so happily started. Still, it was Bill's duty to give him every chance. I see that the team has an opening, Rataka. Perhaps you'd better bat seventh for a few days. Then you can move up to clean-up spot. The giant stopped him. Rataka not ordinary quexa. Rataka a king. Rataka not play like those serfs. What special job? A wild thought struck Bill. On the playing fields were more than two hundred quaxas, most of them with a justified and carefully nurtured dislike of the surly slab of muscle before him. In the old days, they could do nothing individually against him, but the quaxas had learned to fight as a team. If he could only give them a shadow of an excuse, trap Rataxa into rousing their joint anger, take advantage of the prejudices of their newfound love of baseball. 
Then Rataka would get the reckoning that he deserved. The days of his supremacy would be over. The threat of his tyranny would be removed from the happy race. Bill grinned broadly. Sure thing, old pal, he said. He took off his own baseball cap and put it backward on Rataka's head. He signaled for someone to bring over a mask and chest protector. There's only one of these in each playing field, Bill explained. In a way, he's boss of the game. Are you sure you want to do it? Sometimes the players argue with you. Anybody argue with Rataka, the giant said, raising a huge fist. Rataka knock him down. Rataka a king. Boss of game. Okay, boy, you ask for it, Bill said. He thrust a whisk broom into Rataka's hand. You can be umpire, said Bill Bradley. The End of Half Past Alligator by Donald Coven The Holes Around Mars by Jerome Bixby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Science said it could not be, but there it was. And whoosh! Look out! Here it is again. The Holes Around Mars by Jerome Bixby Spaceship crews should be selected on the basis of their non-irritating qualities as individuals. No chronic complainers, no hypochondriacs, no bugs on cleanliness, particularly no one-man parties. I speak from bitter experience. Because on the first expedition to Mars, Hugh Allenby damn near drove us nuts with his puns. We finally got so we just ignored them. But no one could ignore that classic last one. It's written right into the annals of astronomy, and it's there to stay. Allenby, in command of the expedition, was the first to set foot outside the ship. As he stepped down from the airlock of the Mars One, he placed that foot on a convenient rock, caught the toe of his weighted boot in a hole in the rock, wrenched his ankle, and smote the ground with his pants. Sitting there, eyes pained behind the transparent shield of his oxygen mask, he stared at the rock. It was about five feet high, ordinary granite, no special shape, and several inches below its summit, running straight through it in a north-easterly direction, was a neat, round, four-inch hole. "'I'm upset by the whole thing,' he grunted. The rest of us scrambled out of the ship and gathered around his plump form. Only one or two of us winced at his miserable double pun. "'Break anything, Hugh?' asked Burton, our pilot, kneeling beside him. "'Get out of my way, Burton,' said Allenby. "'You're obstructing my view.' Burton blinked. A man constructed of long bones and caution, he angled out of the way, looking round to see what he was obstructing the view of. He saw the rock, and the round hole through it. He stood very still, staring. So did the rest of us. "'Well, I'll be damned,' said Janice, our photographer. "'A hole!' "'In a rock,' added Gonzales, our botanist. "'Round,' said Randolph, our biologist. "'An artifact,' finished Allenby softly. Burton helped him to his feet. Silently we gathered around the rock. Janice bent down and put an eye on one end of the hole. I bent down and looked through the other end. We squinted at each other. As a mineralogist, I was expected to opinionate. Not drilled, I said slowly, not chipped, not melted, certainly not eroded. I heard a rasping sound by my ear and straightened. Burton was scratching a thumbnail along the rim of the hole. Weathered, he said pretty old, and I'll bet it's a perfect circle if we measure. Janice was already fiddling with his camera, testing the cooperation of the tiny distant sun with a light meter. Let us see whether it is or not, 
Allenby said. Burton brought out a steel tape measure. The hole was four and three-eighths inches across. It was perfectly circular and about sixteen inches long and four feet above the ground. But why, said Randolph, why should anyone bore a four-inch tunnel through a rock way out in the middle of the desert? Religious symbol, said Janus. He looked around, one hand on his gun. We'd better keep an eye out. Maybe we've landed on sacred ground or something. A totem hole, perhaps, Allenby suggested. Oh, I don't know, Randolph said, to Janus, not Allenby. As I've mentioned, we always ignored Allenby's puns. Note the lack of ornamentation, not at all typical of religious articles. On earth, Gonzales reminded him. Besides, it could be utilitarian, not symbolic. Utilitarian how? asked Janice. An altar for snakes, Burton said dryly. Well, said Allenby, you can't deny that it has holy aspects. Get your hands away, will you, Peters? asked Janice. I did. When Janus' camera had clicked, I bent again and peered through the hole. It sights on that low ridge over there, I said. Maybe it's some kind of surveying setup. I'm going to take a look. Careful, warned Janus. Remember, it may be sacred. As I walked away, I heard Allenby say, Take some scrapings from the inside of the hole, Gonzales. We might be able to determine if anything was kept in it. One of the stumpy, purplish, barrel-type cacti on the ridge had a long, vertical bite taken out of it, as if someone had carefully carved out a narrow U-shaped section from the top down, finishing the bottom of the U in a neat semicircle. It was as flat and clean-cut as the inside surface of a horseshoe magnet. I hollered. The others came running. I pointed. Oh, my God, said Allenby, another one. The pulp of the cactus in and around the U-hole was dried and dead-looking. Silently, Burton used his tape measure. The hole measured four and three-eighths inches across. It was eleven inches deep. The semicircular bottom was about a foot above the ground. This ridge, I said, is about three feet higher than where we landed the ship. I'll bet the hole in the rock and the hole in this cactus are on the same level. Gonzales said slowly, this was not done all at once. It is a result of periodic attacks. Look, here and here. These overlapping depressions along the outer edges of the hole, he pointed, on this side of the cactus. They are signs of repeated impact. And the scalloped effect on this edge, where whatever made the hole emerge. There are juices still oozing, not at the point of impact, where the plant is desiccated, but below where the shock was transmitted. A distant shout turned us around. Burton was at the rock, beside the ship. He was bending down, his eye to the far side of the mysterious hole. He looked for another second, then straightened and came toward us at a lope. They line up, he said, when he reached us. The bottom of the hole in the cactus is right in the middle when you sight through the hole in the rock as if someone came around and whacked the cactus regularly, Janice said, looking around warily. To keep the line of sight through the holes clear, I wondered. Why not just remove the cactus? Religious, Janice explained. The gauntlet he had discarded lay ignored on the ground, in the shadow of the cactus. We went on past the ridge toward the outcropping of rock, about a hundred yards further on. We walked silently each of us wondering if what we half expected would really be there. It was. In one of the tall, weathered spires in the outcropping, some ten feet below its peak and four feet above the ground, was a round, four-inch hole. Allenby sat down on the rock, nursing his ankle, and remarked that anybody who believed this crazy business was really happening must have holes in the rocks in his head. Burton put his eye to the hole and whistled. Sixty feet long if it's an inch, he said. The other end's just a pinpoint. But you can see it. The damn thing's perfectly straight. I looked back the way we had come. 
The cactus stood on the ridge with its U-shaped bite, and beyond was the ship, and beside it the perforated rock. If we surveyed, I said, I bet the holes would all light up right to the last millimeter. But, Randolph complained, why would anybody go out and bore holes in things all along a line through the desert? Religious, Janice muttered. It doesn't have to make sense. We stood there by the outcropping and looked out along the wide, red desert beyond. It stretched flatly for miles from this point, south toward Mars Equator. Dead, sandy wastes crisscrossed by the canals, which we had observed while landing to be great, shaggy patches of vegetation, probably strung along underground water flows. Blonged! We jumped half out of our skin. Ozone bit at our nostrils. Our hair stirred in the electrical uproar. Look, Janice clattered, lowering his smoking gun. About forty feet to our left, a small, rabbity creature poked its head from behind a rock and stared at us in utter horror. Janice raised his gun again. Don't bother, said Allenby tiredly. I don't think it intends to attack. But I'm sure it isn't a Martian with religious convictions. Janice wet his lips and looked a little shamefaced. I guess I'm kind of taught. That's what I taught, said Allenby. The creature darted from behind its rock and looked at us over its shoulder, employing six legs to make small but very fast tracks. We turned our attention again to the desert. Far out, black against Mars' azure horizon, was a line of low hills. Shall we go look? asked Burton, eyes gleaming at the mystery. Janice hefted his gun nervously. It was still crackling faintly from the discharge. I say, let's get back to the ship. Allenby sighed. My leg hurts. He studied the hills. Give me the field glasses. Randolph handed them over. Allenby put them on the shield of his mask and adjusted them. After a moment, he sighed again. There's a hole on a plain surface that catches the sun. A lousy, damn little impossible hole. Those hills, Burton observed, must be thousands of feet thick. The argument lasted all the way back to the ship. Janice, holding out for his belief that the whole thing was of religious origin, kept looking around for Martians, as if he expected them to pour screaming from the hills. Burton came up with the suggestion that perhaps the holes were made by a disintegrator ray. It's possible, Allenby admitted. This might be the scene of some great battle. With only one weapon? I objected. Allenby swore as he stumbled. What do you mean? I haven't seen any other lines of holes, only the one. In a battle, the whole joint should be cut up. That was good for a few moments, silent thought. Then Allenby said, It might have been brought out by one side as a last resort. Sort of a nace in the hole. I resisted the temptation to mutiny. But would even one such weapon, in battle, make only one line of holes? Wouldn't it be played in an arc against the enemy? You know it would. Well, wouldn't it cut slices out of the landscape instead of boring holes? And wouldn't it sway or vibrate enough to make the holes miles away from it something less than perfect circles? It could have been very firmly mounted. Hugh, does that sound like a practical weapon to you? Two seconds silence. On the other hand, he said, instead of a war, the whole thing might have been designed to frighten some primitive race, or even some kind of beast. The whole out of here. A demonstration. Religious, Janice grumbled, still looking around. We walked on, passing the cactus on the low ridge. Interesting, said Gonzales. The evidence that whatever caused the phenomenon has happened again and again. I'm afraid that the war theory... Oh, my God! gasped Burton. We stared at him. The ship, he whispered. It's right in line with the holes. If whatever made them is still in operation... Run! yelled Allenby, and we ran like fiends. We got the ship into the air, 
out of the line with the holes to what we fervently hoped was safety. And then we realized we were admitting our fear that the mysterious hole-maker might still be lurking around. Well, the evidence was all for it, as Gonzales had reminded us. That cactus had been oozing. We cruised at 20,000 feet and thought it over. Janice, whose only training was in photography, said, Some kind of omnivorous animal? Or bird? Eats rocks and everything? I will not totally discount the notion of such an animal, Randolph said, but I will resist to the death the suggestion that it forages with geometric precision. After a while, Allenby said, Land, Burton, by that canal. Lots of plant life, fauna too. We'll do a little collecting. Burton set us down, feather light, at the very edge of the sprawling flat expanse of vegetation, commenting that the scene reminded him of his native Texas pear flats. We wandered in the chilly air, each of us, except Burton, pursuing his specialty. Randolph relentlessly stalked another of the rabbity creatures. Gonzales was carefully digging up plants and stowing them in jars. Janus was busy with his cameras, recording every aspect of Mars transferable to film. Allenby walked around, helping anybody who needed it. An astronomer, he'd done half his work on the way to Mars, and would do the other half on the return trip. Burton lounged in the sun, his back against the ship's fin, and played chess with Allenby, who was calling out his moves in a bull roar. I grubbed for rocks. My search took me further and further away from the others. All I could find around the canal was gravel, and I wanted to chip at some big stuff. I walked toward a long rise a half a mile or so away, beyond which rose an enticing array of house-sized boulders. As I moved out of earshot, I heard Randolph snarl, Burton, will you stop yelling KT to B2 and check? Every time you open your gap, this critter takes off on me. Then I saw the groove. It started right where the ground began to rise, a thin, shallow, curved bottom groove in the dirt at my feet, about a half an inch across, running off straight toward higher ground. With my eyes glued to it, I walked. The ground slowly rose. The groove deepened, widened, and now it was about three inches across, about one and a half deep. I walked on, holding my breath. Four inches wide, two inches deep. The ground rose some more, four and three-eighths inches wide. I didn't have to measure it. I knew it. Now, as the ground rose, the edges of the groove began to curve inward over the groove. They touched. No more groove. The ground had risen. The groove had stayed level and gone underground. Except that now it wasn't a groove. It was a round tunnel. A hole. A few paces further on, I thumped the ground with my heel where the hole ought to be. The dirt crumbled, and there was a little dark tunnel, running straight in both directions. I walked on, the ground falling away gradually again. The entire process was repeated in reverse. A hairline appeared in the dirt, widened, became lips that drew slowly apart to reveal a neat, straight, four-inch groove, which shrank as slowly to the shallow line of the ground, and vanished. I looked ahead of me. There was one low ridge of ground between me and the enormous boulders. A neat four-inch semicircle was bitten out of the very top of the ridge. In the house-sized boulders directly beyond was a four-inch hole. Allenby winced and called the others when I came back and reported. The mystery deepens, he told them. He turned to me. Lead on, Peters. You're a temporary drill leader. Thank God he didn't say fall in. The holes went straight through the nest of boulders. There'd be a hole in one, and ten or twenty feet further, on the next boulder, another hole and then another, and another, right through the nest in a line, about thirty holes in all. Burton, standing by the boulder I'd first seen, flashed his flashlight into the hole. Randolph, clear on the other side of the jumbled nest, eye to hole, saw it, straight as a string. 
The ground sloped away on the far side of the nest. No holes were visible in that direction, just miles of desert. So, after we'd stared at the holes for a while, and they didn't go away, we headed back for the canal. Is there any possibility, asked Janice as we walked, that this could be a natural phenomenon? There are no straight lines in nature, Randolph said a little shortly, and that goes for a bunch of circles in a straight line, and for perfect circles, too. A planet is a circle, objected Janice. An oblate spheroid, Allenby corrected. The planet's orbit? An ellipse. Janice walked a few steps, frowning. Then he said, I remember reading that there is something darn near a perfect circle in nature. He paused a moment. Potholes. And he looked at me, as mineralogist, to corroborate. What kind of potholes? I asked cautiously. Do you mean where part of a limestone deposit has dis... No, I once read that where a glacier passes over a hard rock that's lying on some softer rock, it grinds the hard rock down into the softer, and both of them sort of wear down to fit together, and it all ends up with a round hole in the soft rock. Probably neither stone, I told Janice, would be homogeneous. The softer parts would abrade faster in the soft stone. The end result wouldn't be a perfect circle. Janice's face fell. Now, I said, would anyone care to define this term, perfect circle, we're throwing around so blithely, because such holes as Janice describes are often pretty damned round. Randolph said, well, it is settled then, Gonzales said a little sarcastically. Your discussion, gentlemen, has established that the long, horizontal holes we have found were caused by glacial action. Oh, no, Janice argued seriously. I once read that Mars never had any glaciers. All of us shuddered. Half an hour later we spotted more holes, about a mile down the canal, still on a line marching along the desert, through cacti, rocks, hills, even through one edge of the low vegetation of the canal for thirty feet or so. It was the damnedest thing to bend down and look straight through all that curling, twisting growth, a round tunnel from either end. We followed the holes for about a mile, to the rim of an enormous, saucer-like valley that sank gradually before us until, miles away, it was thousands of feet deep. We stared out across it, wondering about the other side. Allenby said determinedly, We'll burrow back to the bottom of these holes once and for all. Back to the ship, men. We hiked back, climbed in, and took off. At an altitude of fifty feet, Burton lined the nose of the ship on the most recent line of holes, and we flew out over the valley. On the other side was a range of hefty hills. The holes went through them, straight through. We would approach one hill. Burton would manipulate the front view screen until we spotted the hole. We would pass over the hill and spot the other end of the hole in the rear screen. One hole was 280 miles long. Four hours later, we were halfway around Mars. Randolph was sitting by the side port, chin on one hand, his eyes unbelieving. All around the planet, he kept repeating. All around the planet. Halfway at least, Allenby mused. And we can assume that it continues in a straight line, through anything and everything that gets in its way. He gazed out the front port at the uneven blue-green haze of the canal off to our left. For the love of heaven, why? Then Allenby fell down. We all did. Burton had suddenly slapped at the control board, and the ship braked and sank like a plucked duck. At the last second, Burton cropped up the nose with a short burst. The ten-foot wheels hit desert sand, and in five hundred yards we had jounced to a stop. Allenby got up from the floor. Why did you do that? he asked Burton politely, nursing a bruised elbow. Burton's nose was almost touching the front port. Look, he said, and pointed. About two miles away, the Martian village looked like a handful of yellow marbles flung on the desert. 
We checked our guns. We put on our oxygen masks. We checked our guns again. We got out of the ship and made damn sure the airlock was locked. An hour later we crawled inch by painstaking inch up a high sand dune and poked our heads over the top. The Martians were runts, the tallest of them less than five feet tall, and skinny as a pencil. Dried up and brown, they wore loincloths of woven fiber. They stood among the dusty-looking, inverted bowl buildings of their village, and every one of them was looking straight up at us, with unblinking brown eyes. The six safeties of our six guns clicked off like a rattle of dice. The Martians stood there and gawked. Probably a highly developed sense of hearing in this thin atmosphere, Allenby murmured, heard us coming. They thought that landing of Burton's was an earthquake, Randolph grumbled sourly. Marsquake, corrected Janice. One look at the village's scrawny occupants seemed to have convinced him that his life was in no danger. Holding the Martians covered, we examined the village from atop a thirty-foot dune. The dome-like buildings were constructed of something that looked like adobe, no windows, probably built with sandstorms in mind. The doors were about halfway up the sloping sides, and from each door a stone ramp wound down around the house to the ground, again with sandstorms in mind, no doubt, so drifting dunes wouldn't block the entrances. The center of the village was a wide street, a long, sandy area some thirty feet wide. On either side of it, the houses were scattered at random, as if each Martian had simply hunted for a comfortable place to sit, and then built a house around it. Look, whispered Randolph. One Martian had stepped from the group, situated on the far side of the street from us. He started to cross the street, his round brown eyes on us, his small bare feet plodding sand. And we saw that in addition to a loincloth, he wore jewelry, a hammered metal ring, a bracelet on one skinny ankle. The sun caught the copperish gleam on his bald, narrow head, and we saw a band of metal there, just above where his eyebrows should have been. The super chief, Allenby mumbled. Oh, shaman me! As the bejeweled Martian approached the center of the street, he glanced briefly at the ground at his feet. Then he raised his head, stepped with dignity across the exact center of the street, and came toward us passing the dusty-looking buildings of his realm and the dusty-looking groups of his subjects. He reached the slope of the dune we lay on, paused, and raised small hands over his head, palms toward us. I think, Allenby said, that an anthropologist would give odds on that gesture meaning peace. He stood up, holstered his gun, without buttoning the flap, and raised his own hands over his head. We all did. The Martian language consists of squeaks. We made friendly noises, the chief squeaked, and pretty soon we were at the center of a group of wide-eyed Martians, none of whom made a sound. Evidently no one dared peep while the chief spoke. Very likely the most articulate Martians simply squeaked themselves into the job. Allenby, of course, said they just squeaked by. He was going through the business of drawing concentric circles in the sand, pointing at the third orbit away from the sun, and thumping his chest. The crowd around us kept growing as more Martians emerged from the dome buildings to see what was going on. Down the winding ramps of the buildings on our side of the wide, sandy street they came, and from the buildings on the other side of the street, plodding through the sand, blinking brown eyes at us, not making a sound. Allenby pointed at the third orbit and thumped his chest. The chief squeaked and thumped his own chest, and pointed at the copperish band around his head. Then he pointed at Allenby. I seem to have conveyed to him, Allenby said dryly, the fact that I'm the chief of our party. Well, let's try again. He started over on the orbits. He didn't seem to be getting any place, so the rest of us watched the Martians instead. A last handful was straggling across the wide street. "'Curious,' said Gonzales. "'Note what happens when they reach the center of the street.' 
Each Martian, upon reaching the center of the street, glanced at his feet, just for a moment, without even breaking stride, and then came on. What can they be looking at? Gonzales wondered. The chief did it too, Burton mused. Remember when he first came toward us? We all stared intently at the middle of the street. We saw absolutely nothing but sand. The Martians milled around us and watched Allenby in his orbits. A Martian child appeared between two buildings across the street. On six-inch legs it started across, got halfway, glanced downward, and came on. I don't get it, Burton said. What the hell are they looking at? The child reached the crowd and squeaked a thin, high note. A number of things happened at once. Several members of the group around us glanced down, and along the edge of the crowd nearest the center of the street there was a mild stir as individuals drifted off to either side. Quite casually, nothing at all urgent about it. They just moved concertedly to get further away from the center of the street, not taking their interested gaze off us for a second in the process. Even the chief glanced up from Allenby's concentric circles at the child's squeak and Randolph, who had been fidgeting uncomfortably and paying very little attention to our conversation, decided that he must answer nature's call. He moved off into the dunes surrounding the village, or rather, he started to move. The moment he set off across the wide street, the little Martian chief was in front of him, brown eyes wide, hands out before him, as if to thrust Randolph back. Again, six safeties clicked. The Martians didn't even blink at the sudden appearance of our guns. Probably the only weapons they recognized was a club, maybe a rock. What can the matter be, Randolph said. He took another step forward. The chief squeaked and stood his ground. Randolph had to stop or bump into him. Randolph stopped. The chief squeaked, looked right into the bore of Randolph's gun. Hold still, Allenby told Randolph. Till we know what's up. Allenby made an interrogative sound at the chief. The chief squeaked and pointed at the ground. We looked. He was pointing at his shadow. Randolph stirred uncomfortably. Hold still, Allenby warned him, and again he made the questioning sound. The chief pointed up the street. Then he pointed down the street. He bent to touch his shadow, thumping it with thin fingers. Then he pointed to the wall of a house nearby. We all looked. Straight lines had been painted on the curved, brick-colored wall, up and down and across, to form many small squares about four inches across. In each square was a bit of squiggly writing, in blackish paint, and a small wooden peg jutted out from the wall. Burton said, Looks like a damn crossword puzzle. Look, said Janice, in the lower right corner, a metal ring hanging from one of the pegs. And that was all we saw on the wall, hundreds of squares with figures in them, a small peg set in each, and a ring hanging on one of the pegs. You know what, Allenby said slowly, I think it's a calendar. Just a second, thirty squares wide by twenty-two high. That's six hundred and sixty. And that bottom line has twenty-six, twenty-seven squares. Six hundred and eighty-seven squares in all. That's how many days there are in a Martian year. He looked thoughtfully at the metal ring. I'll bet that ring is hanging from the peg in the square that represents today. They must move it along every day to keep track. What's a calendar got to do with my crossing the street? Randolph asked in a pained tone. He started to take another step. The chief squeaked, as if it were a matter of desperate concern that he make us understand. Randolph stopped again and swore impatiently. Allenby made his questioning sound again. The chief pointed emphatically at his shadow, then at the communal calendar and we could see now that he was pointing at the metal ring. Burton said slowly, I think he's trying to tell us that this is today, and such and such a time of day. 
I bet he's using his shadow as a sundial. Perhaps, Allenby granted. Randolph said, If this monkey doesn't let me go in another minute, the chief squeaked, eyes concerned. Stand still, Allenby ordered. He's trying to warn you of some danger. The chief pointed down the street again, and instead of squeaking, revealed that there was another sound at his command. He said, Whoosh! We all stared at the end of the street. Nothing. Just a wide avenue between the houses, and a high sand dune down at the end of it, from which we had first looked upon the village. The chief described a large circle with one hand, sweeping the hand above his head, down to his knees, up again, as fast as he could. He pursed his monkey lips and said, Whoosh! and made the circle again. A Martian emerged from the door in the side of a house across the avenue, and blinked at the sun, as if he had just awakened. Then he saw what was going on below, and blinked again, this time in interest. He made his way down across the winding ramp, and started to cross the street. About halfway, he paused, eyed the calendar on the house wall, glanced at his shadow, then he got on his hands and knees and crawled across the middle of the street. Once past the middle, he rose, walked the rest of the way to join one of the groups, and calmly stared at us along with the rest of them. They're all crazy, Randolph said disgustedly. I'm going to cross that street. Shut up, so it's a certain time of a certain day, Allenby mused, and from the way the chief is acting, he's afraid for you to cross the street. And that other one just crawled. By God, do you know what this might tie in with? We were silent for a moment. Then Gonzalo said, Of course. And Burton said, The holes. Exactly, said Allenby. Maybe whatever made or makes the holes comes right down the center of the street here. Maybe that's why they built the village this way. To make room for... For what? Randolph asked unhappily, shifting his feet. I don't know, Allenby said. He looked thoughtfully at the chief. That circular motion he made. Could he be describing something that went around and around the planet? Something like... Oh, no. Allenby's eyes were glazed. I wouldn't believe it in a million years. His gaze went to the far end of the street, to the high sand dune that rose there. The chief seemed to be waiting for something to happen. I'm going to crawl, Randolph stated. He got to his hands and knees and began to creep across the center of the avenue. The chief let him go. The sand dune at the end of the street suddenly erupted. A forty-foot spout of dust shot straight out from the sloping side, as if a bullet had emerged. Powdered sand hazed the air, yellowed it almost the full length of the avenue. Grains of sand stung the skin and rattled minutely on the houses. Whoosh! Randolph dropped on his belly. He didn't have to continue his trip. He had made other arrangements. That night in the ship, while we all sat around still shaking our heads every once in a while, Allenby talked with Earth. He sat there wearing the headphones trying to make himself understood above the god-awful static. An exceedingly small body, he repeated wearily to his unbelieving audience, about four inches in diameter. It traveled at a mean distance of four feet above the surface of the planet at a velocity yet to be calculated. Its unique nature results in many hitherto unobserved, I might even say unimagined, phenomena. He stared blankly in front of him for a moment, and then delivered the understatement of his life. The discovery may necessitate a re-examination of many of our basic postulates in the physical sciences. The headphones squawked. Patiently, Allenby assured Earth that he was entirely serious, and reiterated the results of his observations. I suppose that he, an astronomer, was twice as flabbergasted as the rest of us. On the other hand, perhaps he was better equipped to adjust to the evidence. 
Evidently, he said, when the body was formed, it traveled at such a fantastic velocity as to enable it to, his voice almost to whisper, to punch holes in things. The headphone squawked. In rocks, Allenby said, in mountains, in anything that got in its way. And now the holes form a large portion of its fixed orbit. Squawk. Its mass must be in the order of... Squawk. Process of making the holes slowed it, so now it travels just fast enough. Squawk. Maintain its orbit and penetrate occasional objects such as... Squawk. And sand dunes. Squawk. My God, I know it's mathematically monstrous. Allenby snarled. I didn't put it there. Squawk. Allenby was silent for a moment. Then he said slowly, A name? Squawk. Hmm, said Allenby. Well, well. He appeared to brighten just a little. So it's up to me as the leader of the expedition to name it? Squawk. Well, well, he said. That chop-licking tone was in his voice. We'd heard it all too often before. We shuddered, waiting. Inasmuch as Mars' outermost moon is named Diamos, and the next Phobos, he said, I think I shall name the third moon of Mars Bottomos. The End of the Holes Around Mars by Jerome Bixby Chapter 2